So uh, there are the grade boundaries. You need your own copy of the paper because the IB have been closing down channels that, that show the questions. All right, so sublimation is solid to gas, question one. So that gets rid of C, because that's gas to solid. But A, B, and D also are solid to gas. But sublimation is a physical process, just like condensation, melting, freezing, boiling. The chemical, uh, the molecule you have at the beginning, the chemical you have as the reactant, is also going to be the product. So which one's the same before and after sublimation? So it's B, the one with mercury chloride in it, mercury 2 chloride. So one is B. It's a physical process. Two, 77% of people got this one right. So first of all, you need to draw out the, to draw out the balanced equation. So sodium hydroxide plus sulfuric acid goes to sodium sulfate and water. Balance it up. Let's look at the moles. Well, if there's two sodium hydroxides to one sulfuric acid, that's, that's balanced. That's uh, no excess, no limiting. So A, it's 0.2 to 0.1. So that's the correct ratio, 2 to 1. So there is no, no, no excess or limiting there. Looking at B, B's 0.1 to 0.1, and that's the answer. I need a ratio of 2 to 1, but there's only a one-to-one -one ratio here. So there's not enough sodium hydroxide, it's limiting. It would run out first. So the answer is 2B. Question three, uh, this is one of, the, one of the two questions I got wrong on this paper. I don't like it. Uh, if the teacher who's taught it for 27 years is getting wrong, it's probably a bad question. It's a bit big headed for me. Alrighty, so ideal gas. So the ideal gas makes a couple of assumptions to get the PV equals NRT to work. The volume of the individual gas particles is zero. Not the volume of the gas, the volume of the particles is zero. And the collisions are elastic, which means they bounce off each other. If the gas particles were to hit and stick, well, you're on the way to becoming a liquid then, aren't you? So that's not going to be good. So if you want to violate the ideal gas equation, you've got to somehow have particles that don't have a zero volume or that hit together and stick. And so that's 3A. I don't like that as the answer. So molecules have finite volume at high pressure. So if I was to squash these molecules down into a tiny box, uh, decreasing the volume, increasing the pressure, so increasing the pressure effectively, then instead of that gas being mostly space, empty space, now you could argue it's mostly the volume is filled with the, the molecules themselves. And so it violates the uh, one of the two tenets there because the volume of the molecules is important now because the whole pressure has increased. There's not much space. I don't like that one. That's 3A. If you didn't get that, don't worry about it. It's a stupid question. Question four, to separate the zeros from the ones. So we've got E, P, N. Atomic number is the number of electrons, which is also the number of protons in a neutral atom. And the difference is the number of neutrons. That's 29. OK. Uh, so that's going to be C. 4 is C. The only trick they might play on this is they might ask you about the nucleons. So nucleons are protons and neutrons. That's the only little trick they play. Question five. The selenide ion, Se2 minus. Let's go to the periodic table. So there's selenium, and if it's grabbed two extra electrons, it's gonna have 36 electrons. So this is going to end in, this is the 4p6, isn't it? So whatever it is, it has to end in 4p6. So let's look at the possible answers. So A, B, 5A, 5B, and 5D end in 4p6. So it could be A, B, or D. All right, I bet I've done the 
3D, 4D problem. You know, they forget to put the 3D, they just go straight to 4D. So that's what they've done with A. And B. Ooh. So the answer must be D. 5D. Yes, indeed. 5 is D. All right. Question 6 wants to know which one's group 14. Well, I try to remember this kind of pattern. So that's group 1, group 2, group 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. That's the pattern of first ionization energies. Now you've just got to try and match it with this. So three up and one down. So it looks like this one here, three up and one down. So that's group one, group two, 13, 14. So it's that one there. So it's going to be B. Six, yeah, six B. Just memorize that pattern. Seven. Which element is a metalloid? otherwise known as a semi-metal. So you've got the periodic table, uh, you've got to remember where the staircase is. No one's quite sure how far it goes down. And anything above or below the staircase, except for aluminium, is a metalloid. Anything sitting on or below the staircase. So which one have we got? Is it arsenic? Yeah, arsenic is here. So arsenic, that's 7B. Seven is B. Eight, patterns in a periodic table, which trend is described correctly? So which one's the easiest? So let's look at uh, electronegativity. That's the easiest one, I think, to look at. Hopefully you've memorized that fluorine has the highest electronegativity. So as you go down the group, it decreases, correct? And across the period left to right, it increases. Oh, that's it. Oh, that's easy. So eight is D. Is it? Yeah. Nice. Ooh. Yeah, always check for the easy one. Nine. Oh, got an email. Uh, which does not affect the color of a complex formed by a particular transition metal. So there are four things you need to know. It's the, uh, well, it's the actual atom uh, that the transition metal is. You know, is it zinc? Is it copper? Is it? Well, zinc isn't a transition metal in IB. Is it copper? Is it nickel? Is it iron? The charge, is it copper 1 plus or copper 2 plus? Uh, the ligand, is it chloride or water or ammonia? And the number of ligands, is it 6? Is it 4? So those are the four reasons that they have different colours. So 9A, the oxidation state, yeah, copper 1, copper 2, so that's important. The number of ligands, yep, that's important. The identity, so the last one, it's 9D, the isotope of the metal doesn't make any difference. Adding a neutron or two doesn't mess with the electrons and stuff. Question 10. Why are transition metal ions compl uh, complex? Are they, why are they coloured? So just briefly, uh, let's go back to this one. So if I shine light through Roy G. Biv, what has happened to the copper 2 plus is the d orbital has split. It's split 3 and 2. Two and copper two plus has nine electrons, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And when you shine light through one of these electrons, now let's choose that one, is promoted to a higher energy level. And then, whatever wavelength of light caused that electronic promotion, it's removed. So, in this case, uh, I know that orange light is removed for copper, uh, two ions in water. So the orange is gone. And then so the color I would see is Roy G. Biv, but without the orange. And that looks blue, use the color wheel. All right, so 10, what it best explains it. As elect electrons return to lower levels, light is emitted. No, no, there is no light emitted in this process. That's a line spectra, that's trying to trick you there. This is to do with light being absorbed with electron promotion. As electrons return to a lower level, light of a... No, so B is wrong, emitted. So it has to be C or D. Uh, and complementary colour, there we go. So 10 is C. So on the colour wheel, opposite orange was blue. So orange was absorbed and so blue, not emitted, Blue is just uh, what's left over, and you see that. 
So 11. Well, so hydrogen breaks the octet rule, doesn't it? That follows the duet rule. So you could argue the answer is 11D because hydrogen breaks the octet rule. But I think the IB are trying to be a bit clever about it. I think that's poorly worded. So PCL3, phosphorus trichloride, that uh, all of those follow the octet rule. So it's not A. So uh, B, F, 4 minus. I don't know that one, so I have to work it out. So I've got 3 and 4 times 7. That's the valence electrons, and I need to add 1 because of that. Divide it by 2, so I want pairs. That's 28, 32, that's 16 lines. So 16 electron pairs. Okay, so that's just a regular tetrahedral business going on here. There's 16 lines. Everything follows the octet rule. So that one is also incorrect. So B is wrong. I know that D, NH4+, plus, is a simple tetrahedron. So that follows the octet rule. So the answer must be C. So indeed the answer. Is it C? Yeah, the answer is C. Sulfur can have an expanded octet. And so sulfur tetrachloride, that's the seesaw. That's one of the higher level shapes you need to know. All right, 12. They like this question. Almost always, if it's ionic and covalent, that's the nitrate, something nitrate or something carbonate. And I can see that there. There it is. What's that? So that's B. Because uh, nitrate is a covalent molecule, but it's got a charge. So it's an ion as well. And carbonate also is a covalently bonded molecule with a charge. So those are ions. That's a straightforward question they ask every year. But what about the others? Uh, silicon uh, tetrahydride, that's covalent. I would imagine the difference in electronegativity is uh, less than 1.7. This is uh, methanol, so that's covalent. And that's sodium sulfide, a metal and a non-metal. That's probably ionic. All right, 13. What are van der Waals forces? Well, it depends. It depends what you mean. You go on the internet, you go on Wikipedia, they give you different answers. So you just have to follow the IB syllabus here. It says it's dipole, dipole, and London dispersion forces. So it's B, 13B. You might be tempted to say hydrogen bonds is a van der Waals force. A lot of people think it is, but not in IB. So I really don't think they should ask questions like that. Okay, 14. So which compounds contain delocalized electrons? So what have we got here? Uh, C6H10. Just trying to look for the classics like benzene. Ah, so here's benzene. Benzene contains delocalized electrons. I'm also looking for carbonate or nitrate or nitrite. Mm-hmm. Okay, C6H12, that's uh, hexene or cyclohexane, neither of which contain these delocalized electrons. Uh, carbonate. Now, what about hydrogen carbonate? Is that delocalized? I think it must be. So I think it's that one. So hydrogen carbonate also contains delocalized electrons. So there it is. So that must have single and double bonds next to each other where they resonate. I'm going to check. Yeah, that's right. 15. Which of the following is correct? All right. So I drew the molecules out. So this carbon has two electron domains, correct? An electron domain is a single, a double, a triple bond or a lone pair. So that's right. And it's linear. That's correct. And it's a triple bond. So it is SP. So that's the first one. It's A. 15 is A. And you think with a carbon carbon triple bond is SP. Single bonds are going to be SP3. That's 
SP3 and uh, well that's SP3 as well SP2 would be like a carbon-carbon double bond so the answer is 15A okay here's his law you got to manipulate those top three equations in order to get the bottom equation that one looks pretty tricky but normally there's a little key to these and I think I found it so carbon appears only once in those top three equations and once in the target equation so I've no choice but to double everything on the top row to get that 2c so I've doubled that delta H the same principle I see two hydrogens there hydrogen down there so I, I've no choice but to divide that equation by 2 there's no other way to get H2 so if I take that off I make that a half and I take that off I'm going to be dividing that one by 2 are we done? no the C2 H2 the ethine again appears only once but it appears on the other side and on the target equation and halved so I bet we have to flip this one I think we have to flip it and then divide by 2 so that would change the sign and divide by 2 now in a minute and a half I'm not going to do all that and then cancel 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 I just pretty much forget the carbon dioxide oxygens and waters are going to just work out so what answers that then so it's, and, and then to get the, the delta H for the final one you just had to sum everything so it's 2 times minus 394 oh that's all of them and then half of 572 so that's going to be so I've narrowed it down to A or C and then half of plus 2606 half of plus 2606 so that's oh there's two negatives there so that's going to give me A I think that's A is it 16A yes Whew. everything else cancelled out all right 17 breaking that silicon hydrogen bond that nothing else so C must be wrong so C must be wrong because I'm breaking the bond and I'm making this bond here so I'm breaking and I'm making so C is wrong because it's only asking me to break it uh, average bond energies only work for gases so is anything there not a gas no alrighty so looking at the others it can't be D it can't be D because I've broken four bonds between silicon and hydrogen and it only wants me to break one bond so that leaves you with either A or B now they, they both they're both pretty tempting but the IB prefers you to go for B here they like it with the quarters to break all four hydrogens off and then just take a quarter of the value uh, it's not entirely sh clear to me why A is wrong and I'm not if, if, you, if you ask your teacher because I've not found anyone that can explain to me why A is wrong so it's B so 17 is B but I think A is the best wrong answer you just got to get into the rhythm of these questions they like it with the fractions where you break off every atom and then divide by the the subscript so 18 well enthalpy of hydration is turning a gaseous ions into aqueous ions and so that's going to be 18d it's only 18d that follows that a is uh well that's not adding water hydrating anything that's reacting water with itself that's not it's not really hydration is it b is the heat of solution it's tricky to get the, so the solution and the hydration heat uh, straight in your head. If it's paper two, you can just check it out on, in the data booklet. And C, well, the phase change is wrong there, isn't it? It's solid to aqueous, and we need gaseous to aqueous. 19. Entropy change. Well, I've drawn the system, which in this case I put a box around the water 
gas turning to the liquid water. So when you see the word entropy, you can think of the word disorder, and that's good enough for IB chemistry, the word disorder. All right. Uh, gases had the highest entropy, the highest disorder. And so if I'm turning a gas into a liquid, then I must be decreasing the entropy, decreasing the disorder. So for my system, which is the kind of the contents of the box, entropy is going to go down. Now for the surroundings, well, if I'm turning gaseous water into liquid water, uh, I'm making bonds, and which is uh, an exothermic process. It's going to heat up. There's going to be energy released, and that energy is going to bleed out of the system into the surroundings. So if you heat up the surroundings, you're going to increase its entropy. If you heat anything up, it's going to kind of move towards being a gas. I mean, it might not turn into a gas, but it's going to become uh, more gas-like uh, along the spectrum of solid to liquid to gas. And so don't forget, gases had the highest disorder. Okay, 20. So for graph two, you might think, well, that's a catalyst. Yep, uh, a catalyst speeds up the rate of a reaction. So it's a steeper gradient, higher rate, but it finishes with the same volume of carbon dioxide. But catalyst isn't an option. Let's look at the lumps. Definitely you want smaller lumps. If you have smaller lumps, then you have an increased surface area. And so according to collision theory, there's more likelihood of the reactants colliding now. You've kind of opened up the lumps to expose their insides. So it has to be B or C. Now I've made the same amount of acid, which must mean I had the same, excuse me, I've made the same amount of gas, which must mean I had the same amount of acid as well as the same amount of chalk. So I'm going to have to have the same concentration. So that's going to be C. If I had B, where I had a lot less acid, Acid is the limiting reagent. So for B, that must be wrong because acid's the limiting reagent. So if I used a 20th the concentration of the acid, well, it would run out even sooner. And so the line would be a lot lower than one or two. 21, orders of reaction. So keeping the concentration of fluorine the same. I've tripled the chlorine dioxide and I've tripled the rate, which must mean the, the order of reaction for chlorine dioxide is one. If I double the concentration and I double the rate, it's an order one. Is that enough? No. Actually, I have to know for fluorine uh, as well. So for fluorine, if I look at that and that, keeping the chlorine dioxide the same. So I've increased that by a factor of one and a half, and the rate's also increased by a factor of one and a half. Hmm. So the order of reaction for fluorine is also one. And the overall order of reaction is you sum these uh, exponents to give two. So overall order of reaction is two there and one. So that's D, 21 D. Yep. 21D. 22. Uh, this would take me more than a minute and a half to do because I was going to work the graphs out from first principles, but uh, that's how I'd normally do it. But I can remember this much. There's those three graphs here, so these are the ones that are easy to work out. So that's zero order. It doesn't matter the concentration of the reactant. Uh, if the rate doesn't change when you change the concentration, that's zero order. And I remember that's one, and then that's two. And then the other graphs are that, and then that one, and then even more steep for that one. So that's two, that's one, and that's zero. So it looks like you just have to memorize these. No time to work them out from first principles. So which one's right? A's wrong. B's wrong. C or D. Zero order. 
Oh, that's nice. The zero, zero, 001 makes sense, doesn't it? So that's going to be C. 22 is C. Is it? Mm -hmm. Oh, I got a bit of toffee stuck. Mm, Iceland toffee, I recommend it. From the shop, not the country. Okay, so orientation. What well, was called the Arrhenius constant, but he was a little bit of a Nazi who died from uh, basically drowning on his own snot from doing this too much. <laughs> Nazi way to go. I think that's why they now call it the pre-exponential constant. But anyway, that's to do with collision geometry and the amount of collisions. I imagine per unit time. So that's going to be A. 23 is A. And it's A. Is it? Yeah, nice. A. Don't forget that's activation energy, that's the rate constant, and that's Richard Thornley. It, it, no, it's not. It's gas constant times temperature in Kelvin. 24. Okay, so if I increase the temperature, Le Chatelier says for a system in equilibrium, if you stress it, it moves to oppose the stress. So uh, if I increase the temperature, it's going to move to the endothermic side. So I can see that this is XO because it's negative, so that's going to be endo. So if I, if I increase the temperature, it's going to shift to the left. Now, Kc is a constant unless you change the temperature, which is what's happening here. So Kc is going to be products over reactants, the concentrations at equilibrium. If it's shifting to the left, that's going to give me more reactants, so it's going to make this number bigger which means uh, KC is going to get smaller. So KC is going to go down. So the position of the equilibrium moves to the left and KC decreases. That's A, 24A. Yeah. Which is correct for an isolated system at equilibrium. The way I think about this, and again, they rarely ask about this, is uh, just look, we're just looking for stability here. And equilibrium is like a super stable system. So for Gibbs free energy, you remember that... Uh, a negative Gibbs free energy means it's spontaneous, the reaction will happen. So, we, so yeah, equilibrium, that happens. Spontaneous, that's all good. So it's going to be at a minimum. So it's going to be either C or D, because Gibbs free energy is at a minimum. And entropy, well, you know, the universe tends to increase entropy. The more entropy, the more stable a system. So that's going to be maximum, isn't it? So that's going to be C. So 25C. Yes, yeah, so there's a lot deeper reasons and those weird graphs in the books, but they've never asked about that. 26. A bronsted lowry acid base pair are different by H+. plus. So you just have to find two chemicals that are different by H+. plus. So that's C. I'm not going to read the question. 26 is C. They're different by H+. Plus. Oh, nice. 27. So a weak and a strong acid. So the differences the IB want you to know is a strong acid has a lower pH, a higher conductivity, and a faster rate of reaction. But they're always going to try and trick you. They're going to try and trick you to say the stronger acid produces more products. No, it doesn't. It produces the same amount of products, just it takes uh, less time. All right, then the weak acid is less dissociated than the strong acid. So that's true. Strong acids react with the metal oxide, but a weak acid does not. That's not true. Weak acid will react with the metal oxide, just take a little longer. Is that enough? One's right, two's wrong. Yes, yeah, so it must be B. So 27B. Yep. A strong acid does have a greater conductivity than a weak acid. More dissociated, so there's more freely moving charged particles, which are the ions. 28. We kind of lied to you that aluminium chloride AlCl3. It's not really, it's Al2Cl6. Which statement is correct? Okay, it's all to do with Lewis acids and bases. So I have to go back to first principles. I have to think about this boron trifluoride. I can never remember if that's a Lewis acid or a base. But I know in the IB it reacts with ammonia. I know ammonia is a base. And so this is to do with lone pairs of electrons. I only see one lone pair of electrons. So I know that this must be the Lewis base, which donates the lone pair of electrons. And I remember ammonia as a base. And that must be the Lewis acid.
Okay, knowing that, aluminium atoms behave as Lewis acids. So are the aluminium acid aluminium atoms accepting electron pairs from the chlorine? Yes, they are. That's what this date this is what this arrow means. It's a dative covalent bond. Instead of one electron from one atom and one electron from the other atom sharing, it's two from one atom and none from the other. So I think that's the answer, 28A. Yep, 28A. Nice. 29. Okay, acid base curves. So if it's a weak acid added to a strong base. So if it's a strong base, that means that uh, it's going to start at the top of the pH graph. I don't know. Let's say at 14. Let's say that's 7. That's 0. And if I'm adding it to a weak, uh, if a weak acid's being added to it, then the weak acid's not going to go all the way down to zero. It's going to stop off at about here somewhere, isn't it? I don't know, about four. So somehow I want this kind of curve like this. It goes down that. that. So which one's that? Uh, that's B. So 29 is B. Yeah. What's the name of that? Oh, that's a bit cheeky. MN is manganese. Not magnesium. It seems a little, what's the word? Facetious, capricious. That might be a better word to try and confuse people with that. So oxygen uh, tends to have two minus ions. It's the oxide ion, isn't it? The oxide ions, two minus. And there's one manganese. So it's going to be manganese oxide. Now, how many electrons does each metal atom give? It gave four, didn't it? So it's going to be manganese four oxide. Manganese four oxide, that's D. 30 is D. These ones I find a little bit tricky. 61, 65% of people got it right though. All right. So an electrolyte is required, yes. The, the, uh, the solutions here are electrolytes. They're changed by the passage of electricity. That's what an electrolyte is. Anything that's unchanged by the passage of electricity, like a wire, is called a conductor. So A is wrong. The anode is where oxidation occurs. So you need to remember uh, red cat. So red cat reduction happens at the cathode. So that must mean oxidation happens at the anode. So B, that's out. C, ions move in the electrolyte. Yeah, positive ions move, negative ions move. Hey, even if you didn't plug it in, they're going to move. So C, uh, that's true for both of them. So it must be D, whatever D is. Yeah, D looks like an awful one to work out. So 31 is D. Yep. 32. What forms hydrogen and oxygen at the electrodes? All right. So looking at the positive ions here. Uh... I've given the list of uh, electropotentials here. So the lower on the list is preferentially discharged. That's the rule for the positive ion. So if I have potassium and H+, well, where the hell's the H+, come from? Oh, these are all solutions. So that means not only are there the ions, there's also H+, and OH- present each time. So the lowest on the list is preferentially discharged. So for the first one, I would indeed get hydrogen out because that's lower. So that's good. Uh, I would indeed get hydrogen out if I had sodium. And I would indeed get hydrogen out if I had H+, of course. But silver is lower on the list. So if I electrolyzed silver nitrate, because silver is lower on this E-cell list. Well, where do you get the E-cell list? Well, I just kind of remembered it. It wasn't obvious to me you had to remember it until this question, though. So that one's going to be wrong, the bottom one. If I electrolyzed silver nitrate, then uh, silver would come out, and I want hydrogen. Okay, uh, if I electrolyze concentrated sodium chloride, if it's concentrated, the chlorine will be preferentially discharged. So that one's wrong. 
if I, uh, and by the same by the same analogy, if I electrolyze concentrated potassium iodide, iodine will come out. That isn't on the course, but I suppose you can extrapolate from that. So that just leaves me with this one here, with C. Now, you, you should have done that experiment as well. That's a pretty straightforward standard one. So the answer is 32C. Yep. 33, only 23% of people got this right. So the moles of electrons is related to the, uh, the current times the time divided by Faraday's constant. Well, I'm not going to worry about Faraday's constant, so let's just put a proportionality sign in there, right there. All right then. So if I have I over 2 for the silver and 2 time, that's the same number of electrons, the same moles of electrons. So for the second experiment, half the current twice the time is the same number of electrons. So then all you have to do now is account for the fact that zinc is 2 plus and silver is 1 plus. So if I had 10 electrons coming through the circuit, I would make five zinc atoms, but I would also make 10 silver atoms. So I'm going to make twice as much silver as I do zinc. So what's the amount of silver? Twice as many moles as D. So it's 33 D. 34, the alkynes. Every carbon's got four bonds. Every hydrogen's got one. So maybe you just memorized it. Cn, H2n minus 2 is the one for the alkynes. There's basically three you're expected to memorize. Cn, H2n plus 2 alkanes. Cn, H2n is the alkenes, also the cycloalkanes. And this one here, the alkynes. Alrighty. 35. Oh, the old SN1, SN2. I lost a job years ago when I was a, a young, naive chemistry teacher. Someone asked me how I teach SN1, SN2, and I completely spaced on it. I hadn't memorized how to do it. So I just said with balloons, which is kind of stupid. If you don't know the answer, <laughs> the answer is never going to be with balloons. Idiot. Okay. A kid called Tent helped me with this in Bangkok. One, two, three, bang. So SN1 are two-step reactions with tertiary haloalkanes, and they're fast. All right. Oh, well, I haven't read the question yet. Oh, so uh, this is a primary haloalkane. It's a primary haloalkane. Find the halogen. Find the carbon attached to it. How many carbons are directly attached to that one? Just one, so it's primary. So now we've got, uh, well, let's... Let's fix that one, two, three, bang, and just do the opposite. All right, there. So the rate equation is second order. Well, it's only got one step. So the molecularity of the rate determining step is two. So that must mean there's two molecules in a rate determining step. So the equation is second order. Oh, this is the first one, 35, 35A. That was a long way to get there. Thirty-six. So sodium borohydride is a reducing agent and acidified potassium dichromate 6 is an oxidizing agent. So there's really only one molecule you know that can go both ways, reduction and oxidation. I, I haven't looked at it yet, but I imagine it's aldehyde because I can oxidize an aldehyde to a carboxylic acid or I can reduce an aldehyde to a primary alcohol. So which one's the aldehyde? 
think it's B. 36B. That's the aldehyde. Yes, I was thrown off, but I saw the extra carbon there. So if you see CHO, that's aldehyde. And if you see COH, that's alcohol by convention. All right, 37. What contains a chiral carbon? So that's a carbon with four different groups attached. Not four different atoms, four different groups. Those groups may be atoms, but there's got to be four different things attached to it. All righty, so let's scan through. Oof. So it's not this one, because this carbon has three methyl groups attached to it, so it's not that one. This carbon looks tempting. It's got a, a methyl group, a hydrogen, a hydroxyl group, and an ethyl group. Nice. So I think it's that one. Uh, 37A. Yeah, 37A. 38. So if you're reading from the top of the meniscus, uh, that's wrong. Your number's going, always going to be too high. And any error that always goes in the same direction is systematic. So it's a systematic error. You can keep repeating it and taking an average, but that won't fix it. Systematic error. So it must be A or D. And the volume measured. Well, so accuracy is to do with how close you are to the real value. And so the volumes are always going to be a little higher than the real value. So it's going to be inaccurate. So I think it's 38D. Not that inaccurate, but it will be inaccurate. 38D. Yep. 39. Index of hydrogen deficiency. There's this awful equation, but you don't need to learn it. All you need to know is that if there's a ring, you add one. If there's a carbon-carbon double bond, you add one. And if there's a carbon-carbon triple bond, you add two. Pretty much that's it. So looking at this, what has an index of hydrogen deficiency of one? Well, this one up here is, has an index of hydrogen deficiency of four, one for the ring and one each for the carbon-carbon double bonds. This has a hydrogen deficiency of two. This, I have no idea what that is. So I'm going to give that one a rest. And the last one, there's two isomers of this. Interestingly, they're both uh, anesthetics, alcohol or ether. Uh, I don't see any rings, double bonds, triple bonds, so it isn't that one. So it must be this one, whatever that awful molecule is. There must be so many isomers of that, but just by process of elimination, it's going to be uh, 39C. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. And 40 Question 40. Okay, bond lengths in solid compounds. Well, infrared uh, measures bond types. You know, is it a CH bond? Is it a CO bond? Is it an OH bond? So it ain't that one. Mass spectrometry measures the mass of molecules and the fragments of the molecules. That ain't that one. Atoms too. Nuclear magnetic resonance is to do with H1, is to do with hydrogen, so it ain't that, so it's got to be X-ray crystallography. That measures bond lengths. You don't need to know the maths, you literally just need to know, for the core, X-ray crystallography measures uh, bond lengths. And we're done.